So, as, as Steve uh, mentioned, this is a momentous uh, issue, a momentous issue of how um, landscapes are organized, how um, we interact with other species, uh, a momentous it, it, Im, Im, impact for our own health, but also for the planet's health. And so the meatification of diets is, is something that I'm going to try and make some sense of. What do I mean by that as a fundamental context for thinking about some of the uh, envir major environmental dimensions and also human uh, inequality embedded in this, this trajectory of dietary change and then also uh, the interspecies relations. Uh, so what do I mean by meatification? Meatification is a term that um, I use to try to um, basically indicate that meat has shifted from the periphery of human diets, where it was for most of the 10,000 year history of agriculture, to the center. Uh, and the center is um, in, in places like the United States, where meat is and animal products are about 40% of the mass of all agriculture uh, and food um, produced. So. The, the meatification of diets is uh, basically this trajectory towards increasing per capita meat consumption. And again, it's a radical dietary shift for, from the most of the 10,000 year history of agriculture where meat and livestock products were on the margins of human diets. Okay, just going to, to back to the past 50 years or so, to 1960, well, a bit more than 50 years, 1960, there were about 3 billion people on earth. And those three billion people on average were consuming about 23 kilograms of meat per year. Three billion people, 23 kilograms of meat per year. Uh, by uh, 2013, there were over seven billion people on earth and the average person on earth consuming 43 kilograms of meat. So more than a doubling of the human population and a near doubling in terms of the average amount of meat that every person on this planet is consuming on an annual basis. Now that's an extremely uh, momentous shift on a planetary scale. It's also a highly uneven one, and I'll get into some of the unevenness in, uh, at a later point in, in this talk. But just that trajectory there, um, what, what, um, again, the meatification of diets on a world scale, that vector of 20, from 23 kilograms of meat to 43 kilograms of meat from a, in a world moving from 3 billion to over 7 billion is a momentous shift in terms of how people are eating, how they're interacting with other species, and a momentous environmental implications there. So 3 billion, uh, 23 kilograms of meat, and, and a near doubling in the context of more than a doubling of the human population. So that is part of what I hope to get across in, in terms of setting this context of meatification. But again, as, and something I'll pick up later on, this is an ex that's a world average. There's also an incredible inequality built into that average. Now, where is it heading? The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization projects that by 2050, the average person on Earth will be consuming over 50 kilograms of meat. 2050, the average person consuming over 50 kilograms of meat in a world of somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people. So that would mean in roughly a century, more than th three times as many people on Earth and the average person on Earth eating well more than twice as much meat as a century prior. So this, again, this revolutionary dietary shift uh, in a very short period of time. Is this possible? And so you might not be able to see this that clearly, but is this possible? I have a big question mark. This, I think, is one of the big questions of our age, is, is this trajectory going to continue? Can it continue, or can we confront it? Uh, part of this narrative of meatification uh, gets, has been silently embedded in um, the, the notion that world food production must double in uh, the coming decades. So a very loud narrative in world agriculture today is that agricultural production must double by 2050. 2050, so about three decades from now, little more than three decades from now. And this is being pronounced at the United Nations uh, General Assembly, it's been pronounced, it's been pronounced at the, by the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, and some of the world's biggest agricultural corporations, uh, from agro-food giant Nestle to agro-chem, uh, agro-seed giant Monsanto, which might now be bought up by uh, Bayer. Uh, also, they echo this loud narr this this narrative: uh, agricultural production must double to feed a growing world. But 
And I said the, the meatification is silently embedded in that. Um, they sometimes will recognize dietary change as part of this. But even if you add up all the hungry people in the world, which is about a billion people hungry or malnourished today, then another two to three billion people on Earth um, that will be here by 2050 if the projections can, uh, continue. Uh, or if the trajectory of population growth continues as projected, that still doesn't add up to a doubling. And so embedded in that doubling narrative is that humans will continue to consume more and more per capita, uh, uh, more and more meat per capita with rising affluence. And, and I'll talk a bit more about this um, moving forward. Uh, so what is this meatification in terms of animal flesh? What are the, the, the species? Uh, the biggies are pigs and chickens. Uh, so basically on a world scale, um, this is looking at volume of animal flesh uh, increased over about the half, a little more than a half century. And you see phenomenal growth of, of um, various things, but especially pigs and, and chickens. Uh, the, this growth is, uh, again, little more than a half century uh, reflected in this, in this uh, graph. And one of the things that I sometimes say when speaking to undergraduate students about the scale of chicken growth is that in little more than their lifetime, the volume of chicken flesh produced on a world scale has roughly tripled not quite triple, but in the average lifespan of a normal undergraduate university student, uh, just an incredible growth, near tripling of the volume of poultry flesh on a world scale. Um, pigs and chickens alone represent about two-thirds of all animal flesh produced by volume. Pigs and chickens alone on a world scale, uh, and pigs and poultry over 70%, chickens the, the driving force in poultry production. And eggs has grown phenomenally as well on a world scale, not quite at the same uh, rate as chicken flesh, but eggs has, has experienced explosive growth as well. Uh, another way of looking at it that I, I think is a, a valuable way of kind of conceptualizing this is as a pie graph. Uh, this is the total volume of animal flesh produced in 1960. And at that point, uh, pigs and uh, cattle were the two biggest um, sources of, of animal flesh. By 1985, a much bigger pie, this is, this is the world aggregate average, uh, so the rough doubling in, in the space of a quarter century. And one of the things that's very notable, and that's what the arrow there is for, is indicating how poultry has just exploded uh, from about a tenth of all animal flesh to by 1985, about a fifth. And uh, now it is 35%. Poultry is 35% of all flesh, so it is uh, one of the biggest driving forces in meatification uh, on a world scale is, is poultry and pigs uh, and, and the industrial production of those things. Just going to, to a bit more recent picture, 19, um, by 2030, uh, pigs and poultry alone, 71% of all uh, animal flesh by volume. So this trajectory that I've been talking about of meatification, if it continues, the, the FAO's projection, the average person on Earth in 2050 consuming over 50 kilograms of, of meat per year, that growth, if it continues, will be driven overwhelmed almost entirely by industrial pigs and industrial poultry. And uh, is that possible? Again, I think challenging this trajectory is, is, a, is a fundamental uh, question uh, that, that we all, all face uh, when thinking of uh, on, on so many levels, our relationship again with other species, uh, pressures on, on the environment, multi-dimensional pressures on the environment, uh, and qu questions of human inequality. And that's something I'll try and hopefully make some sense of uh, going forward in this lecture. One of the things I try to do with the ecological hoof print, uh, which, which I'll get into uh, in a second, this conceptual framework of the ecological hoof print as, as making sense of the environmental implications of this trajectory. One of the things I try and do is, is um, challenge a, a certain population-centric environmentalism. Uh, so a lot of which isn't to say that population doesn't, human population growth doesn't matter, certainly it does, uh, but that we shouldn't just be focusing our attention on um, human population growth, but also the, the huge inequality of resource consumption on a world scale. So 
on a world scale, and I've, I've given, mentioned this before, three billion people on Earth in 1960, three billion or so, today over seven billion on Earth uh, in, by 2050, nine to 10 billion. And so a lot of environmentalists have, have um, emphasized this as the driving force in environmental degradation. Famously, Paul Ehrlich's narrative, the, the population bomb narrative, uh, was, a, was a very influential one and continues to be a very influential uh, aspect of environmental thinking, that population is the central environmental, um, uh, central force in environmental degradation. And one of the things I try and stress is that uh, there is an other population bomb uh, and we need to be thinking about the population explosion of animals, livestock animals, that dwarfs the population growth of, of human beings. So if we look at the same period when the human population grew from roughly 3 billion to over 7 billion, the population of animals at, and this is the population of animals at any, any one time on Earth, uh, has grown from uh, around 7 billion, th oh, sorry, the not, this isn't all animals, this is uh, livestock animals, uh, from about 7 billion in 1960 to over 25 billion farm animals on Earth today. So tw 7 billion to over 25 billion, this is um, terrestrial farm animals. But then if you look at the slaughtered population, so this is the, uh, the population of animals that are killed every year for food, uh, that has grown f even more dramatic. That's grown by a factor of nine in the space of uh, about a half century. So the human population growth, yes, it's, it's, there has been a phenomenal growth of, of humans on Earth. There's many more farm animals on Earth than there were, almost a fourfold growth in, in farm, the farm animal population. And then the slaughtered population has grown uh, at, at this phenomenal rate of uh, a ninefold increase. And part of the driving f factor in that is not only that there are, is, is much more animal flesh uh, produced by volume, but that farm animals are turned over uh, quicker. So the turnover time of animals in industrial systems has rapidly accelerated. So chickens can be brought uh, from hatch to s slaughter in about six weeks, pigs in about six months. So that's why there are many more animals killed every year on Earth than live at any one time on Earth. Okay, so this is again, I think, a, a really important um, bit of uh, uh, this, this overall picture of dietary change relates to animal lives on Earth, and I'll, I'll come back to this uh, moving forward. And it's not just a question of numbers, it's also the nature of uh, animal lives, how animal lives are organized uh, and the uh, conditions that they face in productive environments, and also the dis a, a, a big thing that I stress is, is the distancing, uh, the physical distancing and, and the social psychological distancing that people have from these growing populations of animals. So right now there's about over 70 billion animals killed for food every year. So, uh, and where is it heading? And this is the, the title of a short paper I have. Uh, if you're interested in the subject, uh, you can search my name and say towards 20 bil uh, 120 billion. Uh, and this is not an inevitability, uh, but this is the trajectory we're on. Uh, if metification continues, again, projected to be driven overwhelmingly by industrial poultry and pigs, that will mean uh, 50 billion more animals killed for food every year in 2050 than are killed uh, today. Uh, so again, this, this is something that, uh, f f far from inevitable, uh, but it is, it, it is the trajectory we're on if things aren't uh, changed. And this, I want to stress, is before we even start talking about fish, uh, which a number many, many, many more. Uh, the, and the uh, shift, and this is something I'm not going to talk about um, in any detail, but I just want to, want to stress that this, this phenomenal growth in, in animals killed for food every year is, is not counting fish. Uh, and the shifts in production in oceans is, has been very dramatic. So global, the total... Um, annual fish catch grew by a factor of five from 1950 uh, to uh, the past decade. But that continuing growth in production isn't driven by open ocean fisheries, it's driven by uh, aquaculture growth, which has exploded from a sliver of all world fish production in, in the early 1980s to almost half today, 
Almost half of global fish production occurs in uh, industrial aquaculture systems from, again, virtually nothing in 1980 to almost half today. Um, and one famous ocean ecologist said, by the end of the 21st century, if the trajectory continues, almost all fish will come from industrial systems and eating a wild fish or something caught in the open oceans will be uh, as rare as hunted meat. Um, so that's about, we're about at half of all fish production coming from industrial aquaculture. And increasingly these systems are connected, terrestrial factory farms and, and uh, monoculture production tied to industrial aquaculture. There's, there's flows of um, feed between these two things. How, are, how do you feed all these fish in, in, in confined spaces um, in nearshore aquaculture environments? Okay, but moving back to terrestrial uh, production. Uh, which is the focus of, of the ecological hoofprint. Um, agriculture is the biggest land use of, of human societies, by far. Okay, now there's different ways of estimating it. The FAO, um, the, the, the F, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations long gave, gave a figure that about 10% of the Earth's non-ice land area is in crops or aero, um, uh, permanent cultivation, and about a quarter of the Earth's non-ice terrestrial area in pasture. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, estimated that about a quarter of the Earth's land surface is given to what it called agriculture and a mixture of um, path where th there is at least 30% of the landscape is cultivated and a mixture of uh, crops and pasture. And this, this map kind of indicates that, that enormous um, footprint of, of agriculture. And there are some, some other a, a assessments, a big assessment uh, a few years ago suggested about 12% of the Earth's uh, non-ice land is in um, crops, permanent crops, and about 22% in pasture. But in any event, both are, are a huge uh, part of, of human uh, land use. So pasture 22 to 25 percent, uh, and there is a huge range in stocking density. So in some pasture, you know, there, there um, animals can be relatively densely stocked on, on rich grasses. In some areas, um, they are very sparsely stocked, hi highly arid areas. Um, the degraded soils of former tropical rainforests have very low uh, stocking densities. And um, the extensive Pasture is, uh, has been a momentous force in global land use transformations uh, over long periods of time. And it's an enormous force to, uh, to this day in tropical deforestation, uh, cattle, extensive cattle ranching, and also increasingly feed, law, uh, f feed crop production are a major force on the, on the frontier of, of the Amazonian deforestation. Um, and Extensive ranching is also uh, a major force uh, in desertification in, in many arid environments around the world. So pasture is, is, is the biggest uh, footprint of all um, uh, aspects of, uh, of livestock production. And this is a big part of what um, the annual greenhouse gas uh, budget is uh, from agriculture is from tropical deforestation to desertification. And desertification is uh, amplified by climate change, but desertification also contributes to climate change because there's a loss of uh, vegetation and soil-based carbon. And so the, uh, the, the f tro the agriculture's, animal agriculture's role in tropical deforestation and desertification is a major part of uh, estimates of, of how much uh, agriculture how much of a role agriculture plays in climate change and why m livestock production is so central to agriculture's overall greenhouse gas footprint. But crops are also very, very important part here, cro uh, crop production. And uh, animal feed occupies about a third, not quite a third, but close to a third of the world's arable land. So land given to permanent crops, um, about a third of that goes not directly to people, but goes to animals before it's consumed by people. Okay, so feed crops uh, are uh, effectively occupy close to a third of the world's arable land, again, which is about 10 to 12% of all land, non-ice land on Earth. 
And so those feed crops are go those, what I describe them as oceans of uh, monoculture grains and oil seeds are flowing uh, into these growing islands, that po those population, growing populations that I'd mentioned, those islands of uh, industrial livestock. So about a 30% of the world's uh, arable land devoted to coarse grains and oil seeds that's devoted to animal feed. Uh, another way of looking at this picture, a very powerful way, I think, this was uh, basically uh, a group tried to visualize uh, an estimate made by environmental scientist Vaclav Smil, and he, what he tried to do was calculate animal biomass on Earth. Uh, so not individual animal populations, but basically the biomass of all animals, and, uh, including humans in this picture. And so the, the middle picture there is humans, those seven plus billion of us. Uh, and then what else shows up in this picture is that livestock make up the dominant, uh, not well, in it, along with humans, the dominant animal biomass on Earth. So environmentalists long fo have long focused on the uh, endangerment and threat and, and endangered and threatened species, uh, which are really a tiny. Uh, uh, amount of all mammalian biomass on Earth, and I, I, to stress here, this is this is uh, m mammalian biomass, not all all animal life. Uh, but this is where environmentalists have long focused: is uh, animals that are fed, um, uh, shrinking in population and who's, who are losing habitat. Um, but they've often not paid enough attention to the exploding populations of animals in um, factory farms and feedlots, which are, uh, again, a very large share of all uh, mammalian biomass on Earth. And another aspect of this picture here that um, it doesn't entirely come through in this uh, looking at just mammalian biomass at any one time on Earth is that there is also, it's, it's missing the, the, the phenomenal growth of, of poultry, uh, which is, again, the biggest driving force in, in contemporary livestock growth, but also the fact that animal populations on Earth at any one time are being cycled, uh, livestock, industrial livestock animals are being cycled very, very quickly. Uh, so there's this very rapid turnover. Again, industrial chickens can be bought from hatch to slaughter in, in six weeks, industrial pigs in six months. So there's this very rapid turnover. So when we go into a supermarket, uh, you know, you can see many thousands of items on a shelf, uh, all kinds of diversity is staring at us in some ways. Uh, so we see all these different brands, all these different packaged items, uh, and in, in, in many North American supermarkets, it seems like a, a cornucopia. But underpinning that uh, apparent diversity, uh, and I use this term pseudo-diversity from Su uh, Susan George, um, there is it sort of disguises a radical narrowing of our food system and a narrowing in both the biological sense and a narrowing in terms of the economic sense. So um, there is actually a small number of very dominant corporations that control most of that, most of that shelf space and there is a radical narrowing in the sense of what are the things that are going into that food system. Uh, on a world scale, about 10 crops are uh, occupy over 90% of the world's arable land. 10 crops alone. Um, and three livestock species are responsible for more, well, uh, well more than 90% of all animal flesh, uh, and, uh, as well as milk and eggs. So there's this radical narrowing, biophysical narrowing of crops and animals, uh, and then there's also this narrowing of control. And this is, a, a, I think, a very powerful kind of depiction of, of some of this control um, behind the labels that you see. You know, there's a small number of very dominant entities. And, and there's a researcher at Michigan State named Phil Howard who's done, has a whole um, set of um, images that sort of vi help visualize the, the webs of control that underpin the, the apparent diversity that, that we encounter in supermarkets. In terms of grains and oil seeds, uh, there are a handful of, of very dominant uh, corporations, sometimes often referred to as the ABCDs, uh, Archer Daniels Midland, Bungie, Cargill, Louis Dreyfus, um, and then in the slaughter and packing side of things, you know, a small number of players like Pilgrims, Tyson, Purdue, Cargill, Smithfield. Now this is, these are, you know, historically have been very dominated by um, 
uh, on a world scale, uh, American and European players, but there's a, a real global dimension to this, the, the, this consolidation. And so these giants are, have expanded very dramatically uh, on a world scale in recent terms, uh, uh, sorry, in recent times, and uh, one of the dimensions of this is, is the, the enormous growth of, of uh, some huge Chinese players uh, in both grains and oil seeds and increasingly in livestock. So uh, a few years ago, and this drew a fair bit of attention in, in the States, the biggest pig uh, slaughter uh, and packing company in the world, Smithfield, uh, which has uh, presence in, in many different countries in the world was bought out by a Chinese giant. Uh, so Smithfield, they've kept the label Smithfield in the U.S., but it's um, uh, actually controlled by uh, Shineway or WH Group in China. Uh, and so this was on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, China makes big U.S. play. And they're now Smithfield is, you know, part of a subsidiary of a Shineway or WH Group, which now is the, wor the world's largest port company with, with presence in many, many different uh, uh, countries of the world. So this is part of the radical narrowing of control, is this globalization of a, of a handful of very dominant players. Uh, but the biggest meatpacking uh, company in the world now is, is uh, actually a Brazilian firm, JBS, which has um, built on all kinds of acquisitions in recent years of both American and other uh, companies. And uh, some of the most technologically advanced livestock systems uh, are obviously here in, in the United States, but also in places like uh, China and Brazil and National Geographic graphic did an incredible uh, set of images of the Brazilian livestock sector and just how and which has experienced a phenomenal industrialization so a lot of people when they think about Brazilian animal agriculture they think about cattle in Amazonia and that's certainly a part of um, the uh, environmental impacts of animal agriculture in, in, in that part of the world. Uh, cattle is, uh, is, is by far the biggest land use on deforested Amazonian land, but Brazil is also a major uh, producer of industrial livestock, a phenomenal growth of industrial pigs and chickens, and also a phenomenal um, growth in, in the production of feed crops, especially soy. So this pseudo-diversity is, is something that, again, has a very narrow biophysical bio basis, and it's a very difficult system for most people to make sense of, right? Go into your supermarket and, and how uh, difficult it is, think about how difficult it is to have any sense of where your food came from, the conditions under which it was produced. Even most of the ingredients that you would see on packaged foods are very hard for most people to have any ability to decipher. Uh, and, and increasingly, you know, sourced from uh, very distant areas that, uh, again, people have no way of, of having a, a sense of where it came from or the conditions under which it was produced. It's a very hard system to make sense of uh, in some ways. So you can think of it as a very opaque system uh, and, and, and very uh, narrow in economic, uh, in, in terms of economic control, narrow in terms of biology, but immensely complex in terms of the way things are flowing from land to mouth and the, and the processing that goes on in between. So what is the ecological hoof print? One of the big things I try to do with the ecological hoof print is to make sense of how these productive environments are organized uh, by these environments. I'm talking about industrial monocultures indus uh, and, and industrial livestock operations and why it is a major uh, problem for the planet, for people, and for animals. So it's a, it's a systematic way of thinking about the socio-ecological relations of industrial livestock production. Okay, so uh, the term the ecological hoof print builds on uh, a very well-established co um, concept in environmental studies uh, that goes back to this um, book, The Ecological Footprint, uh, by Mathis Wagernagel and, and William Rees in the 1990s. And by the, with the ecological footprint, one of the things they were trying to do was to um, make visible the fact that modern industrial societies are, are it's very difficult to understand our envi the environmental implications of our everyday lives. Um, so, you know, we live in ways that we, we don't often see where things came from, where they go. The resource budgets of our lives or the pollution loads of our lives. And so what they tried to do with the ecological footprint was to say, by consuming and polluting, we are effectively occupying ecological space. 
uh, very differential ecological space on a world scale. Uh, so one of the things they were trying to do was to say, yes, population growth matters, but we also need to recognize uneven consumption on a world scale as a fundamental part of understanding environmental degradation. And again, there is, it, it's very hard to make sense of all of the environmental implications of our everyday lives in complex modern societies. Where do things come from? Where do they go? How much space do we effectively occupy on Earth? And so they tried to take that sort of big idea and give it some empirical precision. And they've spent a whole lot of time, um, as have many other scholars, trying to calculate the footprints of modern societies. And one of the big things that the footprint has given us is uh, attention to inequality in environmental degradation, is to say rich countries like Canada, where I'm from in the US, effectively occupy far more environmental space because they consume so many more resources and emit so, so much bigger pollution loads. And so they basically say, okay, you can add, they're, they're, you can add up uh, the various dimensions of consumption and you can make sense of the, the, the differential ecological space uh, different uh, societies occupy. And so what they've really done, I think the, one of the great contributions of the ecological hoof, uh, footprint over the past few decades is to stress that inequality matters in environmental degradation on a world scale. Uh, and so, you know, they're, by no means are they saying we don't need to think about population growth, but they're saying we need to add this layer uh, as a fundamental part of, of thinking about environmental change on a world scale. And one of the, another big thing that they've lo long stressed is that uh, we're sort of running what they describe as an overshoot, that we're consuming uh, far more planet's worth of resources than uh, is... is uh, sustainable and so they basically say you know we're consuming um, as many as four what they call phantom planets uh, so this is another one of the contributions of the of the footprint as a concept now the footprint as a concept has been translated in a range of ways you may have heard atmospheric footprints or water footprints these are different ways uh, again of calculating differential resource budgets and pollution loads um, and uh, probably the atmospheric footprint I think is the one that's had the biggest traction and this is basically a way of, of visualizing differential greenhouse gas emissions on a world scale annual greenhouse gas emissions and this is from a few years ago uh, but it um, one of the big things it does is look how, how, how small Africa shrinks in relation to the United States. There's about three times as many people living in Africa as live in the United States. Uh, and the th 360 million, I should say, is, is not just the United States population. That's U.S. and Canada, which I've grouped together um, with similar levels of, of um, annual greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of attention has been given to the fact that China has recently passed uh, the U.S. as the biggest annual green, uh, emitter of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, but China has about, well, more than three times as many people as the U.S. Um, so one of the things that the, the, the atmospheric footprint has done is to, to, to give attention to the very uneven levels of, of per capita greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is a fundamental part of understanding cl uh, climate change is, is the hugely differential responsibilities on a world scale. Now this has also been, uh, the footprint concept has also been applied to the water footprint. There's uh, uh, Arjen Hoekstra, uh, a European scientist, has done a lot to sort of draw attention to the very differential levels of, of fresh water resource availability and consumption. And he talks about the, you know, the water that's embedded in uh, different products or the, the footprint, differential water footprint in different products. Um, so again, atmospheric and water story. Uh, and again, with respect to climate change, it's, it's really important to recognize that the US and Canada together are about 5% of humanity and for many decades have been well over uh, a fifth of all greenhouse gas emissions on a world scale. So that foundation, the ecological footprint, is, is part of what uh, I bring to the, the idea of the ecological hoofprint. And what I try and do is to systematically think through the resource budgets and pollution loads associated with uh, the dietary transformations I've been talking about, the meatification of diets, and the hugely unequal consumption of animal products on a world scale. 
So, so far I just talked about the, the world average, the fact that the average person on earth is consuming nearly twice as much meat as uh, occurred uh, a few generations ago uh, in 1960. But this is a hugely unequal picture on a world scale. So, the av and, and so this map here uh, is a way of visualizing some of that unevenness. The darkest shades there are the countries that are consuming uh, the, the, most, uh, per, um, the most meat per capita uh, in the world. And at the highest level, that's about 100 uh, to 140 kilograms of meat. And places like Australia, Argentina, the United States, Canada, and some parts of Western Europe are, are really at the apex of that meatification. In contrast to most of Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, under 20 kilograms of meat per person, uh, and, um, and most of South Asia, which is under 10 kilograms of meat per person per year. So one of the things I try to do is to, to systematically think through the resource budgets and pollution loads of, uh, that underpin the industrial grain oil seed livestock complex and then think about how this relates to world inequality uh, and, and inequality both as a reflection of world inequality the command of arable land the command of water the command of uh, various uh, other resources and also uh, how it's exacerbating inequality uh, in, in, the, in the sense of its contributions to climate change, which are pl the, the impacts of climate change are playing out first and worst in, in many of the world's poorest countries. So the one aspect of this trajectory that I've been talking about with, uh, that, that has got the most attention is, is certainly climate change. So there's been a lot of attention to how uh, Animal agriculture is a major force in climate change. The head of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a number of years ago said, you know, that one of the biggest things you can do is to reduce meat consumption. Uh, and it's, this has got a fair bit of attention from uh, the New York Times to Der Spiegel in Germany, Scientific American, uh, that have basically recognized that animal agriculture matters with respect to climate change. And, and again, one of the things I hope to do with the ecological hoofprint as a concept is, is to get, provide a systematic way of thinking about these impacts. So this centrality of unequal consumption that was a fundamental part of the ecological footprint is something I bring to uh, the ecological uh, hoofprint and, and, and emphasize that this trajectory of meatification of dietary change on a world scale is exceptionally unequal. So this picture that I've already talked about, three, um, the world moving from three to seven billion, the average person consuming almost twice as much meat over this time, uh, heading towards 50. There's a very uh, embedded in that world average is, is huge inequalities. The average American consumes uh, close to 120 kilograms of meat uh, per year. So almost three times the world average. And one of the things I try to do with the ecological hoofprint is to say this is something that societies have long uh, celebrated as, as measures of modernity, measures of development, uh, the increasing uh, meat consumption per capita, uh, but it's also something that very powerfully reflects world inequalities and in many ways is exacerbating uh, world inequalities. Uh, in terms of world meat production, uh, the uh, the obviously phenomenal growth in, in places like the US and Canada, uh, Western Europe, um, with all of that together is a bit more than 10% of humanity uh, that dwarf the production of, of livestock production in uh, Africa and South Asia, which together is about 40% of humanity. But some of the biggest growth is happening outside of um, uh, the most industrialized countries like uh, uh, North America and Europe, and it's happening in places like China and Brazil. China is now by far, in a way, the world's leading uh, producer of uh, uh, meat. It dwarfs uh, the production of the U.S. and China with a, 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 around 12, just under 20 percent of the world's population. So again, this is this is part of the the backdrop. The phenomenal growth of per capita meat consumption in China is is, is also tied to the phenomenal growth uh, and glo growing global presence of, of major Chinese corporations like Shineway. Uh, but about a fifth, a bit less than a fifth of humanity, and China now consumes uh, about 28% of the world's meat and is home to half the world's pigs. <laughs> 
and it's a site where a lot of the growth of, of fast food has been concentrated in recent years. The BBC had a story uh, last year where they said that one of the most recognizable faces in China is, well, Mao is still recognizable, obviously, in China, but one of the most recognizable faces, they said, by a survey is, is now uh, old Colonel Sanders in China. Uh, reflects you know, something, the presence of um, McDonald and Yum Brands and those sorts of things has, has uh, really exploded over the past few decades. Uh, Ed Bertinsky a, a very famous photojournalist uh, from Canada uh, has documented some of the, the, the scale of huge, this is a huge industrial processing plant uh, for poultry, actually not pigs, but poultry. Uh, so this is, uh, th this phenomenal growth of, of livestock production in China um, is uh, tied to an, an incredible industrialization of livestock. Uh, in China, again, half the world's pigs. This is a visualization of the pig, world's pig population, and we see just how uneven it is, so heavily concentrated in China. And in pockets of the U.S., most of the U.S. pigs live in a handful of states like North Carolina and, and Iowa. Uh, and then also in, in Brazil is a, a major uh, site of an industrial pig production in pockets of Europe. Uh, but the question of feeding China's pigs is, is a momentous uh, it represents a momentous shift in, in Chinese agriculture. China can't feed its, its own pigs. Increasingly, its pigs are being fed in part by huge flows of soybeans that are moving from South America to ch across the Pacific Ocean to China. So uh, a few decades ago, China uh, basically w um, was largely self-sufficient in um, grains and oil seeds. Now it is the world's biggest importer of soybeans by far and uh, there's this huge movement of industrial soybean um, uh, from uh, South America, not Brazil and other parts of South America. An area that's so big it's been dubbed the Republic of Soy uh, that stretches from um, southern Brazil into Uruguay into northern Argentina and part of Paraguay. The Republic of Soy is a big part of the story of feeding China's pigs. So what I try and do with the ecological hoofprint is, is again, to, to stress this uneven consumption uh, on a world scale and also how, you know, how s some parts of the world are, are growing very dramatically, really racing towards North American or European levels of, of animal product consumption in a very short period of time. And this is a very powerful dimension of the world food system. So, uh, and tied to this very uneven consumption on a world scale is, is a huge, hugely uneven resource budget, uh, set of resource budgets and pollution loads. Okay, so this is just visualizing some of the, the top part there is the, the picture of the um, per capita meat consumption I've already shown, the average American consuming about 117 kilograms of meat per year versus the average person in South Asia under 10. The flip side, and there's al it's almost an inverse mirror image between per capita meat consumption and uh, where the world's hunger is, uh, is concentrated. So what, I, what do I mean by inverse mirror image? Basically, the countries that are consuming by far the least animal products are those places where there is by far the most hunger and food insecurity. Uh, most of the world's food insecurity and hunger is concentrated in Africa and South Asia and uh, which uh, have been dubbed the hunger hotspots hot in, in this uh, global hunger index that comes out every few years. Um, so this inverse mirror image that the, 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 the richest countries in the world consuming by far the most uh, meat per capita and the poorest countries uh, in the world that consume the, by far the least meat per capita uh, with, with the most widespread food insecurity. One of the things that's really important to understand about this is that it, ri the rich countries of the world are not just consuming far more meat per capita than the poorest, but th through that they're also consuming far more grains and oil seeds uh, and commanding far more other uh, agricultural resources. So this inverse mirror image there I try, I try to stress as, as a really important part of this overall picture of inequality. So there's much more grains and oil seeds uh, and arable land occupied by people living in rich countries than by uh, people living in poor countries. So again, what I'm trying to do with the ecological hoofprint is to systematically think through the resource budgets and pollution loads that go into uh, systems of industrial livestock, and, which include uh, very fundamentally the in, um, systems of industrial monoculture feed production. So these things are in utterly entwined. 
in many ways, the landscapes of, of uh, monocultures, industrial monocultures, and industrial livestock uh, are, are disarticulated, so they're physically separated. Animals in industrial livestock settings uh, don't touch the earth, except, well, cattle um, on feedlots do. Uh, but there is this very r radical disarticulation of animals from land, monocultures from islands of industrial livestock, uh, but they're fundamentally interconnected. Uh, so that's one of the, a really important part of making sense of the ecological hoofprint as a conceptual framework is, is to think about how industrial monocultures are organized and how industrial livestock operations are organized and the resource budgets and pollution loads attendant to both of them. So a fundamental question for thinking through this, this the systematic implication of these um, systems is, is how our productive environments are organized. And there's a fundamental imperative towards mechanization and, bio, and to mechanize in agriculture, there's a need to biologically standardize and simplify environments. So the, this, this fundamental imperative of biological simplification and standardization to enable mechanization or economies of scale is a fundamental part of making sense systematically of the resource budgets and pollution loads that go into these uh, environments. So uh, one of the big things I try and do is, is present a way of thinking through how the uh, dominant landscape in, in North American agriculture and, and a growing presence on a world scale, the industrial grain, oil, seed, livestock complex, how these environments are organized. And what I mean by that is a small number of uh, grain and oilseed monocultures that are devoted to a small number of animal species that are growing uh, very rapidly in scale. And again, this occupies close to a third of the world's arable land. Uh, coarse grains, uh, in especially corns, oilseeds, especially soybeans, flowing through a small number of, of animals, which again, which I've called the big three here, livestock, pigs, poultry, and poultry overwhelmingly chicken, and cattle, uh, and cattle, um, the least industrialized of those big three, but dairy cattle is industrializing very rapidly and the, uh, the feedlot uh, production of cattle is also uh, in increasing on a world scale. And so that's those systems of coarse grain and oilseed monocultures tied to islands of concentrated animals uh, occupies about a third of the world's arable land. And so these things are, are fundamentally interconnected. The huge grain and oil seed flows into uh, the, 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 the large and, and growing uh, populations of concentrated animals. So the, one of the ways I depict these landscapes is as oceans of monocultures, oceans of a small number of things that are flowing into islands of animals. And those islands of animals uh, are, again, both disarticulated from land but fundamentally dependent upon these huge flows of, of feed. So there is both this disarticulation of animals from land, but also the, the re-articulated through huge flows of concentrated um, uh, grains and oil seeds. Okay, so thinking through how these productive environments are organized is at the core of this, this conceptual framework and making sense of the resource budgets on one hand and the pollution loads on the other. Uh, so these are environments that very few people in North America see. Uh, so very few people will ever, in North America will ever see a pig or will ever see a chicken. Virtually all of that production is contained in warehouses um, that are um, not part of people's everyday um, sort of thinking uh, and, and, and they're sort of beyond the sight of, of most people and the, 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 the sight and thought process of most people. One of the only ways that I think people encounter pigs in North America anymore is when, they're, when they might see a transport truck carrying them on the way to, to slaughter. Um, and that, that is, um, again, I think a very uh, important part of this overall trajectory is the, the physical and the, the social and psychological distancing from animals. Um, for most of the history of agriculture, there was a very intimate connection to, to farm animals. Most people would have seen farm animals in their everyday lives. Well into the 20th century, most people lived in rural settings and they would have had a very clear sense of how animals lived and died, probably. In many cases, they might have even known the animals they were consuming, and they consumed them at much smaller volumes than they did today. 
But this picture here uh, sort of tries to indicate the fact that for most of agriculture's history, animals had this multifunctional role in farming systems. So they provided labor. In many cases, labor was the most important thing that humans got from animals. They provided condensed nutrients. So they, um, they spread their manure uh, around fields and, uh, and provided, uh, in some cases, a very important source of um, fertilizer, in some cases also a, a source of fuel, a manure used as a source of fuel in certain parts of the world. The animals also a fundamental um, role in moving things across space, and then other byproducts, obviously hides and wool. And then they provided some flesh and eggs and milk. And so in many cases, eggs and milk were more important than flesh and the consumption side of things. But what do I mean by that term, protein factories? That's actually not my term. It's borrowed from Francis Moore Lappe, who wrote a very famous book um, in the early 70s called Diet for a Small Planet. And what she meant by protein factories was to say, for most of agrarian history, animals generated protein, which was often relatively scarce in agricultural societies. They generated protein on the margins of crop production. So they generated protein by scavenging on crop stubble, by um, feeding off household food wastes, by um, um, feeding off fallowed land and then returning, returning condensed nutrients uh, to the land. So they generated protein, but they didn't really compete with humans for the product of crop production. Now, there would have been some crop production for overwintering animals in, in cold climates, uh, but for the most part, animals were generating this relatively scarce nutrient protein in, um, in ways that didn't compete with uh, uh, the cr humans for the, the product of crop production. Another thing that she stressed was that this consumption of, uh, whether it be animal flesh or milk or eggs, was on the margins of human diets, not at the center. And again, this is a really important thing I try to emphasize with meatification, is just how radical this dietary shift has been to, m to the, the increasing per capita consumption of animal products. So there's this fundamental rupture of um, the historic place that farm animals had in, in mixed farm agricultural systems, and there has been this kind of obliteration of multifunctionality, and now the, the sole function of animals in industrial livestock systems is to put on flesh as quickly as possible or pump out milk and eggs as quickly as possible. Uh, and so they don't, uh, they no longer return condensed nutrients to land, they no longer have a role, obviously, in moving things over space, um, um, and they no longer uh, have a role in, in on-farm labor. They are, um, uh, again, designed to pump out flesh, milk, and eggs as quickly as possible. But the way they generate protein is, is fundamentally different than this historic place that animals had in mixed farming systems, and I'll come back to that. Um, so to think through systematically the environmental implications of this, uh, th this uh, industrial grain oil seed livestock complex, it's really important to think ag again about the biological narrowing that is necessary to enable economies of scale and mechanization. So that uh, increased scale, increased mechanization uh, creates a host of biological and physical problems that are never resolved, they're continually overridden. Okay, and this is a very important part of understanding the resource budgets and pollution loads of the system as a whole. So the mechanization is both in the monocultures, those oceans of monocultures, and the mechanization in the islands of uh, concentrated animals. So one of the most fundamental contradictions of this system is the accelerating soil erosion. Okay, so soil, um, is lost at much greater rates than it is uh, regenerated in, in systems of industrial production. So uh, people who champion the, the huge yield gains that have been made in industrial monoculture production, and there have been phenomenal yield gains, they often leave out the fact that those yield gains, one of the things they hinge on fundamentally is phen phenomenal growth of uh, fertilizers. So. The, the loss of soil is sometimes referred to as uh, soil mining because nutrients are, are being depleted um, and, and not regenerated in, in systems of industrial monoculture production. So how is that problem resolved? Well, it's never resolved 
Industrial monocultures have not fixed the problem of soil degradation. They've basically overridden it with continual inputs of nitri pr principally three fertilizers, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus fertilizer. The NPK fertilizers are the dominant source of soil fertilization on a world scale. And the, the production and movement of fertilizers entails an enormous energy budget. Okay, the, nat the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer uh, is very resource intensive, very energy intensive um, in the manufacture and often moved over significant spaces. There's an energy budget there. Uh, the mining of phosphorus and potassium fertilizer uh, has an energy budget in the mining, the processing, and often the movement over large spaces. So there is a tremendous amount of energy embedded in managing soils of industrial monocultures. Okay, people don't, don't, often don't think about just how much energy goes into the managing soils in, in uh, our food system. And this is a fundamental part of our food system is the energy that goes into the manufacture um, and the movement of fertilizer. So again, uh, this problem is never solved, but it's overridden through uh, with, with a very resource-intensive uh, systems of, of fertilize, fertilization. Another problem that's never resolved in industrial monocultures is the increased vulnerability to pests. So when huge landscapes are given to a small number of, of crops, there is a greater vulnerability to, uh, to pests. And by pests here I'm talking about uh, weeds and insects and fungus and so there's both this and an ex what I call an expanded vulnerability to pest threats when when landscapes are specialized and there's also an expanded definition of what are the problem so because a monocultures uh, really want only one thing to grow and so this is another fundamental part of industrial monoculture production is the, the massive growth in pesticide consumption. So in industrial monocultures, there has been roughly a threefold increase in yield, so the amount of product coming out of individual plants, which is a phenomenal gain. There's no denying that yield gains have not been phenomenal over the past um, 60 or 70 years. But Underpinning those yield gains of about a factor of three are more than a tenfold increase in pesticide consumption and more than a tenfold increase in fertilizer consumption. And again, in the manufacture and the movement of fertilizers and pesticides, there is an enormous resource budget. And there's also downstream costs of those fertilizers and pesticides uh, in, in, in many, many ways. So that's a, a very important part of understanding the resource budgets and pollution loads of this system as a whole is the, is the story of pesticides. Um, and the pesticide story also, uh, the, the, this tenfold or so increase of pesticide consumption on a world scale, also ties to the uh, declining soil health. So industrial monocultures are very, um, uh, they, they tend to increase the, the loss of soil nutrients uh, based on how uh, landscapes are special, uh, specialized and, and huge level areas of bare ground between planted rows. Well, also the huge proliferation of chemicals is, is responsible for the declining soil health as well. The high yielding seeds that have brought those um, great yield gains that I, I'd mentioned um, are also dependent upon increasing water consumption. And so industrial monocultures are sometimes described as being thirstier than crops grown in mixed farming systems. So there are these uh, drier um, soils in industrial monocultures and then also seeds to get those big yield gains depend on a lot more water. Uh, and so that's been described as thirstier seeds. And so this, these systems of industrial monoculture production are tied to uh, massive expansions in irrigation on a world scale. And that ties to resource budgets, uh, both in terms of the pull of water from lakes and rivers, uh, but also in some cases fossil energy, pumping water against gravity, uh, both from uh, sometimes from lakes and rivers, and in many cases from underground reservoirs. So a very large area of the US West is tied fundamentally to uh, a, an underground aquifer 
that is not regenerating, the, the Ogallala Aquifer, which uh, waters a huge area of the U.S. High Plains uh, and makes it productive. So there's this increased irrigation budget as well. And these problems are never fundamentally resolved. The soil degradation, the increased vulnerability to pests, the increased water demands, they, they're never fundamentally resolved. They are continually overridden through uh, continual applications of fertilizers, pesticides, uh, water that um, uh, are, are a fundamental part of the, the continuing productivity of these environments. And then another aspect of the, that's uh, a fundamental part of this biological simplification is that uh, when huge areas of landscape are given to a small number of things, food necessarily must move much farther. So in the case of the U.S., is a, uh, you know, that we have a whole area that's called the wheat belt, another area that's called the corn belt. When you have biological simplification and standardization, on a massive scale, it necessitates the movement of things over longer uh, spaces. And so there's this need for uh, expanded energy in the movement of things over space. And so that's another part of this, this uh, overall energy and resource intensity. And so sometimes people have described this as food miles, that the average item of food in North America travels, some estimates are as, as many as 1,500 uh, miles from land to mouth. And so there's this energy budget in the movement of, of food. Uh, and there's the energy budget also in the movement of inputs into farm systems. Okay, so everywhere there is this dependence upon fossil energy. Fossil energy in the machinery, fossil energy in the fertilizer manufacturing movement, fossil energy in the petrochemical derivatives of the pesticides, fossil energy in the movement of pesticides and the application of pesticides, lots of fossil energy in the irrigation pumping, fossil energy in the movement of things over greater space. And so there's a, a, a quote from Brett Clark and Richard York, modern agriculture has become the art of turning oil into food. There fossil energy permeates our uh, industrial monocultures. And it's something that people often very th think very little about. Uh, Michael Pollan had once famously estimated that there are about 10 calories of oil embedded in one calorie of industrial food. Now that's an incredibly complex calculation, but it speaks to how deeply oil is embedded in industrial food production, again, from the machineries, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the irrigation, and the movement over greater distances. And all of this, this deep fossil energy dependence, all of this is uh, just speaking here on the, the side of monoculture production. This a, and, and this has an array of ecological costs. It's part of the story of greenhouse, a big part of the story of greenhouse gas emissions is, is related to this big energy budget. Um, fertilizers are also a major source of nitrous oxide uh, emissions. Um, and so this uh, story, modern agriculture has become the art of turning oil into food is, is a, a, a big part of the overall climate impacts of, of industrial agriculture. It's also tied to a whole array of other ecological risks and vulnerabilities uh, from depleting rivers, degraded riparian zones, to huge algal blooms. Every year in the Gulf of Mexico, there is an enormous dead zone that kind of waxes and wanes, it waxes and wanes, but it the, pr the ultimate root of the Gulf of Mexico dead zone is the excess nutrients that are washing off across the very productive agricultural heartland of the U.S. and the Mississippi River Basin, the excess nit nitrates and phosphates that are running off of land into the Mississippi River, flowing out into the Gulf of Mexico and leading to this huge growth of algae that basically chokes out aquatic life, and that's why it's called a dead zone. Uh, and some years it's the size of the state of Connecticut, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, that is a direct product of in, uh, industrial agriculture in, in the U.S. agricultural heartland. So that's another example of this kind of array of ecological costs in addition to the atmospheric ones. Now the second part of the ecological hoofprint is to think about those islands of industrial livestock, those growing populations of animals that I was starting off with earlier in this lecture. Uh, and one of the things that I stress is those islands of anim animals where there are these huge flows of grains and oil seeds going into those islands, 
a lot of the nutritional content of those grains and oil seeds is lost in cycling them through animals to produce flesh principally, but also eggs and milk. So as you cycle grains and oil seeds through animals to produce food, a lot of the nutritional content of the, the crop production is, is basically wasted in animals' metabolism. So this is something that I stress is basically serves to magnify the resource budgets and pollution loads I was just talking about in industrial monocultures, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the irrigation demands, the uh, movement of things. Those huge resource budgets that are embedded in industrial monocultures get magnified by the fact that a lot of that nutritional output is basically burned in animals' metabolism before it's even used. Uh, so this is something that Francis Morlape, again, was very fundamental in identifying. And I mentioned her earlier saying this term, um, that livestock historically were protein factories, generating protein from uh, crop, eating crop stubble, grazing on fallowed land, eating household food waste through most of agrarian history. She also then coined the term reverse protein factories, which basically uh, stresses that as you feed grains and oil seeds to animals, a lot of that nutritional product, a lot of the protein and other nutrients are effectively wasted. They're burned in animals' metabol met met metabolic processes before they become food outputs for people. So she said, you know, whereas animals historic livestock in small densities in mixed farm systems through most of agrarian history were protein factories generating this scarce nutrient, relatively scarce nutrient in many contexts, in industrial systems they are reverse protein factories, meaning that a lot of the protein generated in crops is burned and used very inefficiently. So this term reverse protein factories uh, highlights this, this metabolic wastage that's a fundamental part of the, the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex. And, and again, as I stress, it really magnifies the resource intensity of industrial monocultures. This is a, a map from the, the Nas a National Geographic report on, on food security in the, in the coming uh, number of decades and it, I think it very valuably highlights just how much of the North American landscape is devoted to feed crops. Now uh, it's sort of at a, cr a crude um, level. The purple area is feed and also biofuels um, in, the, in North America principally ethanol and then the green area is, is more food crops and again what you see is a lot of North America's landscape in fact, the large majority of the crop production in the United States and Canada is not fed directly to people, it's fed to animals before it ends up as, as food for people. And again, there's this uh, enormous nutritional inefficiency there in cycling feed through animals to produce food. So the way I picture the industrial grain oil seed livestock complex is as a small number of these uh, large-scale monocultures, these oceans of monocultures, again, principally uh, in North America and principally on a world scale, maize and so uh, soybeans, but there are other feed crops as well, flowing through these islands of concentrated animals, the, the pigs and poultry being the biggest source of growth, uh, but also factory farm um, dairy is growing and, um, and feedlots are also um, growing and producing the, the big three, uh, pigs, poultry, and cattle. And so on one side, there is this amplification of the resource budgets and pollution loads of industrial mono, monocultures, the magnifying effect, uh, which I've spoken about. And then there's the other side of the resource budgets and pollution loads of these con uh, islands of concentrated animals is the fact that uh, these are very resource intensive, those islands are very resource intensive spaces as well. Okay, so there's the, f the resource budgets on the industrial monoculture side, which then are am effectively amplified by the fact that a lot of the nutritional output of industrial monocultures is lost to animals' metabolic processes. But then there's also the fact that these islands of concentrated animals are very resource-intensive spaces. Um, so again, to make sense of this envir overall environmental um, implications, we need to think about both sides of this system, the oceans of industrial monocultures and the islands of concentrated animals. Uh, now, now I'm flipping this story around and, and focusing uh, principally on the factory farms and feedlots, and I'll, I'll do this very briefly. The factory farms and feedlot uh, also 
create a lot of biological and physical problems. When you pack thousands upon thousands of birds, um, hundreds in some cases thousands of pigs together, uh, there are a lot of problems that are engendered by that, those densities. Uh, animals weren't meant to live in those concentrations. And so there's a whole range of, of biological and physical problems, or what I call barriers to scale, that are uh, tied to the way these productive environments are organized. Oops, sorry. Uh, to the way these um, productive environments are organized. One of the basic problems, which is something I've already been stressing, is that animals burn a lot of the feed that is given to them in their metabolism before it turns into flesh, milk, and eggs. So one of the things uh, industrial livestock production has long wrestled with is how do you enhance the conversion of feed to flesh, feed to eggs, feed to milk? Okay, so there's this challenge of um, overriding the metabolic losses that are inevitable in cycling feed through animals to produce food and also to try and increase the turnover of animals to make them produce things faster again flesh milk and eggs and so the reproductive limits of animals is in many ways a barrier to um, the to, to, to industrial scale now how is this overridden well it's overridden in a range of ways one of the ways is that animals genetics have changed very radically chickens can as i've stressed now um, be slaughtered at six weeks after hatching pigs after six months that's a, a product of, of decades long of, of innovation in terms of changing pig and chicken and, and uh, genetics um, there's also uh, control of temperatures, the accelerated reproduction, pigs and poultry are artificially inseminated um, in, in North American uh, industrial livestock production to accelerate, again, the, the, the turnover time. Another aspect of this uh, efforts to enhance the uh, efficiency from uh, of converting feed into animal food outputs is the, the growth of pharmaceuticals. And so their pharmaceutical growth uh, began partly to manage some of the health risks associated with the, the great densities of animals. But over time, it was found that increasing pharmaceutical consumption enhanced the ability of animals to turn feed into flesh and other outputs. So the, there was a growth of sub what's called subtherapeutic use of pharmaceuticals. Um, so it's not being used to treat a particular illness, but it's being the chronic low doses, which is tied to efforts to enhance the feed conversion efficiency from grains and oil seeds into um, flesh, eggs, and, and milk. So that's another part. And then another big part of this uh, challenge of reducing metabolic losses relates to something I was starting out with earlier, this phenomenal growth of poultry on a world scale. Poultry are much um, uh, more efficient converters of feed to flesh than our grain-fed cattle or, or pigs. But there's also a problem in describing it that way, and this is something I've stressed. It's not necessarily that they're more efficient converters of uh, feed to flesh or feed um, to, to, to um, eggs, it's that they're less inefficient. There's still considerable uh, nutritional losses uh, and wastage in, in the metabolic processes of animals. Um, the artificial insemination, again, is a fundamental part of our food system that people don't think about. This is how pigs, turkeys, chickens are reproduced uh, today in North America, is artificial insemination. It's a basic part uh, of our food system that probably very few uh, people uh, know about or, or, or certainly think about. Um, another big part of the, the risks of uh, the biological and the physical risks of production inherent in producing so many animals in such great densities is the fact that animals are living beings they can suffer uh, and the animal uh, uh, or the the industrial livestock industry has long described this sort of euphemistically as stress uh, but really it's fundamentally about suffering and the suffering uh, basically ranges from um, oh, 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 the, the, the confinement of animals in, in uh, battery cages to uh, the, the, the huge concentrations of um, broiler hens in, in huge sheds uh, to uh, other forms of confinement. And, and one of the basic ways that the 
the problems associated with this production has been overridden is through pharmaceuticals. Again, there's been this phenomenal growth of pharmaceuticals in industrial livestock production. But another way, the problems associated with the, the, how these productive environments are organized is just blunt force, physical mutilations. So another basic part of our food system that people rarely think about is, is how things like um, the, the, the chick de-beakers are, are just ubiquitous in our food system. The chicks, as they're hatched, their beaks are clipped off so that they don't peck each other to death or injury in confinement. Um, so, uh, and I have there, I don't know if you can see that, the every four seconds. When at hatcheries, um, there is this de-beaking process that happens at a lightning speed. Chicks are basically taken and their beaks are clipped off, um, euphemistically often termed beak trimming. Uh, and, and this is a basic, fundamental override to enable chickens to be packed in, in these great densities is, is, to, is to mutilate them shortly after birth. Um, one incredible statistic uh, that never uh, ceases to amaze when, I, when you think about it is that there are more chickens killed today in a single day in the United States than were killed all year in 1930. That's less than a century ago. It's just an incredible transformation of, of productive environments. And I'd encourage you to look at animalvisuals.org, uh, which he tries to visualize. He basically takes the United States Department of Agriculture slaughter statistics and tries to visualize them. Uh, and what he so and and what this image does here is it basically is it's like every second of every day, 24/7, all year. It's the, the and and what it maybe you can see there it shows the the birds the chicken dots are literally flying across the screen uh, almost 300 chickens killed in the united states per second 24 hours of every day uh, so it's and all that is is united states department of agriculture statistics visualized it's a very powerful uh resource to to look at he also presents this attempt to try and think about how these productive environments um uh or how, how they feel, um, obviously you can't feel it by you know, looking at this uh, on, on a two-dimensional screen, but he basically tries to visualize or put you in a gestation crate or put you in a battery cage and try to think about the sounds, the, 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 the environment. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a look if you're interested in this at animalvisuals.org, a, a very powerful website. And another part of the physical mutilation is, is uh, things like castration. Most of the physical mutilations that happen without anesthetic, uh, and I've mentioned the de-beaker. Um, so the de-beaking, the tail clipping, the castration, the toe cutting, needle teeth clipping, ear notching, tail docking, dehorning, these are fundamental things that enable animals to uh, be packed in these growing densities. Um, and overwhelmingly performed without anesthetic, as I've mentioned. Another big part of the, the ecological um, the challenge of, of packing animals in these great densities is the, the increasing risk of disease. When you have, again, thousands upon thousands of, of birds and, and pigs, sometimes hundreds up to thousands of pigs, uh, dairy, uh, again, increasingly industrialized as well, there's increased risks of pathogens spreading amongst dense populations, uh, the filth that's generated by these huge and unnatural concentrations. Um, so disease risk is a constant challenge for uh, these island, in these islands islands of concentrated animals. And again, how is this solved? Well, it's never solved. It's overridden, and it's overridden in a range of ways. Again, the pharmaceutical story that I've been stressing, insecticides are often a basic uh, necessity uh, to deal with uh, bugs, or in some cases, uh, um, uh, there's also need to sometimes poison rats. Uh, the, the use of disinfect, chemical disinfectants along with big water demands to clean out these environments. Uh, all of these are, again, not part of solving the problem, but managing it on a continual basis. And one of the great risks that this is starting to draw a lot of attention by public health scholars is the risks, the long-term risks of pharmaceutical use in these environments, which both in terms of the residues in the food supply, but also the residues in water, and the, the long-term risk of superbugs innovating, so bugs that become uh, increasingly resistant to antibiotics. Uh, and this is something, again, that I, I think there's been more and more attention to right now, the greater risks of things like avian flu, uh, swine flu uh, becoming more virulent over time, and, and the declining uh, effectiveness of antibiotics. 
Um, so avian flu, we've seen a number of these scares in recent years. Uh, not scares, more than scares, there have been a number of incidents of avian flu in one case in Asia. Millions of birds were destroyed uh, to, to de as, as the way of managing that problem. And if you can imagine what how I've talked about the violence of the, the, the way these environments are managed in terms of animal lives when animals are worth a small amount at the point of sale. If you can imagine if that at the point going from you know, small val low value commodity to something that needs to be disposed of, if you, you can imagine the sort of conditions uh, with which they were disposed in some cases buried alive, uh, incinerated in, 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 in huge fires. Some really gruesome stories of, of how some of the avian flu uh, outbreaks have been managed in recent uh, years. Again, uh, again, w when you think about low value commodities, as they become an expense to be disposed of, uh, some some exceptionally gruesome stories of, of the how that problem is is managed. Uh, again, another part of this. Um, system that is, uh, is ubiquitous, but that people often don't think about, is just how much pharmaceuticals are consumed by animals. About uh, four times as much pharmaceuticals are consumed by animals in the United States as are consumed by people. Four times. Okay, so the, the pharmaceutical, this is a long-term risk in terms of the uh, effectiveness, uh, and this, uh, this is something that's getting a lot of attention in terms of its public health implications, the d declining effectiveness of antibiotics over time, uh, this is a big risk. And then another big environmental implication is the huge amounts of feces and urine generated by these dense concentrations of animals. Where does that go? It's that historically small densities of animals uh, as I said, had a role in fertilization. Now there is this uh, concentration of animals in these great densities that produce so much fe fecal matter that can't be applied onto uh, surrounding landscapes. And in addition to the volumes, it's, di it, it's also a different, of a different character. Uh, so the, the uh, fecal matter contains the uh, residues of the pesticides and the pharmaceuticals, uh, so it, there's a need for, for treatment. And so another part, of, a fundamental part of these landscapes are the huge lagoons of uh, fecal matter and these concentrations uh, that are sometimes referred to as lagoons, which I think is a kind of a gross euphemism for what they really are, and they create a lot of uh, public health risks for the surrounding communities, uh, and, and uh, both airborne contaminants and, and water contaminants. And then the, the last thing I'll mention is that, again, because landscapes are so specialized, both feed and uh, animals must move over greater and greater distances uh, between land and all ultimate consumption. And this, in the case of animal production, uh, and animal production means that there's a lot of energy, not just in moving things around, but also in the refrigeration at varying stages. Uh, so there's the increased transport of moving animals around. Uh, often animals moved from sites of birth, specialized sites of birth to where they're grown, to um, sites of concentrated um, uh, slaughterhouses, so there is what I describe as a spatially disaggregated conveyor belt. Animals are basically sh moved around at different stages of production, uh, and from birth, not always, but in many cases, from birth to growing, to transport, to slaughter, uh, and again, the consolidation of slaughterhouses means they're often moving over greater distances, and there's this energy budget that is tied to that movement, and then also, an, in terms of the end product, the greater refrigeration demands. Now, in the U.S., this is a depiction from USDA statistics of, of where poultry is concentrated. You, see, you can see it's concentrated in a few big areas, like uh, uh, mi parts of Middle America and Delmarva Peninsula um, and, and, and parts of the West Coast. And a lot of the feed gets, m and pigs are exceptionally concentrated, as I was mentioning earlier, in places like Iowa and North Carolina. And so feed moves over great spaces to, to get to these sites. 
<laughs> and so there's this there's an energy budget in that movement and then there's an energy budget in the processing um, of uh, animal flesh and derivatives the, the the production the huge slaughterhouses and then the refrigeration go into a supermarket and see what are the dominant uh, items that are need to be refrigerated and it's very heavily livestock products uh, both so there's a the refrigeration at the points of slaughter and processing and then at the retail and in houses so this story, modern agriculture has become the art of turning oil into food. We can see that at both the organization of productive environments in monocultures and in those islands of uh, concentrated animals. And this also is a way of thinking about the uh, ecological and atmospheric costs. So what I, again, what I hope to do with the ecological hoofprint is to think systematically about how productive environments are organized, both the oceans of industrial monocultures, the islands of concentrated animals, and to think about the resource budgets and pollution loads that are, are, are ingrained in, in those productive environments. And, and again, ultimately, this is a, a story of, of incredible inequality on a world scale. It means that, you know, people in North America, Canada, or the United States are not only consuming far more meat per capita than people in poor countries, but they're also consuming far more grain and oil seeds, and through this, far more uh, fertilizers, pesticides, and a, a, whole array, a, a whole array of other inputs. Um, so one of the big things I try to do is, is to stress there are these resource budgets and pollution loads, both in the oceans of monocultures, the islands of animals, and this is, uh, again, a fundamental part of our everyday life that people think very little of, and, and hopefully I've presented a way of, of thinking about about uh, this um, system that is, uh, again, such a momentous force in, in, the, in the world agriculture, uh, a momentous and growing one, uh, and one that I think fundamentally needs to be challenged. Um, so I will leave the story there. <laughs> Okay, so I'm happy to take questions if people have any. <laughs> One sec, please. Oh. Is there any numbers about the measurement of exotic meats? I know in Asia they eat dogs, and then there's other tigers, all kinds of animals that are eaten around the world. Are they part of that aggregate number of influence on the world? Bush, bush meat is, our, is a major f conservation threat in certain parts of the world. So by bush meat, it, 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 it comprises a range of things, including primates in Africa or par uh, various things in Asia. Um, that's, uh, so bush meat is a, a very proximate conservation threat and biodiversity loss in certain parts of the world. But it, on a world scale, in terms of the volume of production, it's, it's not a significant part of the volume uh, of meat. So the, as I said, over 90% of the volume of animal flesh comes from uh, pigs, poultry, and cattle, and uh, poultry overwhelmingly chickens. So it, it not diminishing the story of bushmeat hunting in, in certain areas, it is a very, ish, uh, very uh, proximate threat to biodiversity in, in certain contexts. Um, but it, the, it, on a world scale of consumption, it's, it's not a huge um, uh, role in terms of per capita consumption. In China, again, the China, um, the China is a major um, importer of not, uh, exotic. Um, uh, like endangered species, the black market endangered species, it's a major uh, import market for various products, uh, including, you'd mentioned tigers, um, but the, uh, the, the driving force in, in Chinese diets, uh, dietary changes, is overwhelmingly pigs and also poultry. Poultry. One thing I should also say about China that's very notable, because it's often presented as this um, uh, bogeyman, I guess, in, in, in the global trajectory of, that I've been talking about, the Chinese government has basically, in, in the past year, has recognized that this is a, a really destructive course. And so the average Chinese person consumes 64 kilograms of meat per year. So that's well over the world average. In 1980, they were well under the world average. So they went from well under the world average to today well over. And for a long time, the Chinese government was explicitly trying to get to North American levels of meat consumption as a goal. 
now the Chinese government is saying this is not a sustainable system and we need to step back and they've recently set a target for reducing per capita meat consumption by close to half. Um, now whether that materializes or not we'll see um, but the Chinese government just within the past year has basically said w having long celebrated the meatification of diets in China is now suggesting well actually this for uh, the, the environmental basis of this is unsustainable and we need to be moving back. Um, but the the last thing I'll say about the endanger, the, the, the trade in exotics, it is huge. It's one of the biggest black markets in the world, the biggest being drugs and exotic animals is generally seen as the second biggest black market. Um, and it's um, not centrally about flesh, it's a whole range of other things. But the, the trade in um, uh, exotic animals, both living and dead parts, um, is uh, is, is much bigger than many people would appreciate. And for many um, may, big conservation uh, organizations like the Worldwide Fund for Nature, um, they stress the, the, the needing to curtail the trade in, in uh, uh, exotic animals, again, both dead and alive, as a, as a very uh, central part of uh, biodiversity conservation in, in, in various parts of the world. So it is a, a very big issue in a general sense, uh, but it's a sliver, I mean, it's not a significant part of oh, the, the overall trajectory of, of animal flesh consumption that I was talking about. Okay, uh, one last question. The, the oil industry, and I'll you throw in there the pharmaceutical industry and the transportation industry, how much, I know there's gotta be numbers, but how much influence do they have on maintaining the factory farming in, uh, <laughs> business globally? In, with, influence in general through lobbyists and everything else? Are there numbers out there to <laughs> quantify that? Um, well, one of the things I'd stress, I'd, I'd suggested, and I didn't say it in, in tons of, discuss it in tons of detail, but the, the, the concentration of power on the agro input sides of seeds, chemicals and by chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and uh, animal pharmaceuticals. They're in, in very uh, intertwined. And so a small number of uh, huge corporations are, are dominant on a world scale in seeds, pharmaceuticals, and agrochemicals. Now seeds are often tied very directly to specific chemicals, and pharmaceutical players have become major players in agrochem because Again, pharmaceutical markets in animal uh, production are so huge. So there is this very powerful nexus of pow a very powerful nexus of um, chem, agrochem, seed, and pharmaceuticals that uh, has consolidated very dramatically over the past few decades. And it's consolidating as we speak. Right now, there's a, a big um, merger in the works of Bayer potentially uh, buying out Monsanto, Dow, DuPont uh, merged together. There's about 10 huge corporations that control the world's uh, huge majority of the world's commercial seeds, uh, pesticide markets, uh, and, f and farm, uh, animal pharmaceuticals. Um, so uh, the question of how they're related to this whole system, I mean, they, they're uh, very powerful lobbyists, both in the US and, and, and various other parts of the world. Um, and uh, and they, they have had, a, a, I think, a very powerful role in, in shaping the overall uh, trajectory of uh, the stuff that I've been talking about. Uh, but again, the, the, on a world scale, it's not just the consolidation here in this country, it's, it, it's increasingly on a world scale. So there is about 10 corporations that control um, a, a large majority of the world's sales and uh, commercial um, seed sales and, and, um, and animal pharmaceuticals and also chemicals, and they're often the same big players. Thank you.